You'll note that some of the seats have name tags. Please don't sit there unless that's your name. <laughs> It helps. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask you to please find a seat so we can keep to our time schedule. event of this afternoon, the Elmer Stotts Lecture. The program honors uh, Elmer Stotts, whose exemplary contribution in government serves as a standard. Mr. Stotts' long and distinguished career was capped by his service as the Comptroller General of the United States, and the Stotts Lecture Series was launched by him to help bring greater attention to the issues of improving government management and operations. It's my distinct honor to introduce the moderator of our Stotts Lecture today, Valerie Lemmy, uh, an adept strategic thinker with more than 35 years of experience in solving public problems and controversial issues in government, governmental organizations and local communities. Academy Fellow Valerie Lemmy joined the Kettering Foundation after a distinguished career in public service. Over the course of her professional career, she served as city manager for the cities of Petersburg, Virginia, Dayton and Cincinnati, Ohio, Commissioner of the Public Utility Commission of Ohio, and District Director and Acting Chief of Staff for Congressman Turner from Ohio's 10th District. She's also served as an adjunct professor at Howard University and the University of Dayton, and as a fellow at the Center for Municipal Management at George Washington University. We are so honored to have Valerie moderate this afternoon's discussion, and she's going to introduce it and her panel. Again, as uh, Teresa mentioned, I'm Valerie Lemmy, a NAPA <coughs> fellow and past board chair, uh, and the director of exploratory research at the Kettering Foundation. And at the foundation, we study how to make democracy work as it should. So what a fitting opportunity to be here this evening uh, to talk about the work of some courageous, innovative leaders in integrating social equity practices and policies into their work. But let me first begin by congratulating our uh, new fellows, and I know uh, only we stand between you and your induction, so we will uh, do our best to finish as close to 5.30 as, as we can. Uh, and that means our panelists have agreed to about a five, seven minute uh, presentation. Uh, and then we'll do a question to them and we'll open it up for questions uh, for all of us. But to set the stage, what I would like to do is to have you do some role playing. And I want you to think about your reactions if you're walking down the street in a low-income area. You're walking alone with someone. A group started, starts to walk towards you. A group is walking away from you. The group is of females. The group is of males. The group becomes boisterous. They're quiet. You're brown, black, or you're white. You're young or you're old. You feel safe or you feel at risk. You're looking forward to meeting new people and to engage. You're afraid, fearful, run away, call the police. So as we think about the work that we do in engaging with people and in social equity, what are our own biases, our own values as we come to the table? Are we open and willing to try something new, to find ways to <coughs> develop 
organizational cultures that lend themselves to social equity practices and principles, or are we going to wait for someone else to take the leadership role? In 1968, H. George Fredrickson wrote that inequality and injustice, especially based on race, was pervasive. Yet public administrators beginning in the 1940s emphasized efficiency and economy. Issues of equity and injustice were not central to public servants, to public administrators, uh, or theorists. They just were not something that we were, in my early career, taught to do. Values were outside of the repository of public professionals. Attempting to remedy this glaring inequity in both thought and practice, George Fredrickson developed a theory of social equity and put it forward as the third pillar of public administration, holding the same status and values as the principles of efficiency and economy. And he realized that public administrators and public administration should adhere to this because he reasoned to say that a service may be well managed, that a service may be efficient and economical, still begs the question, well managed for whom, efficient for whom, and economical for whom. George and Phil Rutledge led the early adoption of social equity by the Academy, championed and supported by many of you in this very room. And while social equity is a thread throughout all of our grand challenges, 50 years after the concept first put forward by George Fredrickson as a third pillar for public administration, and almost 30 years after NAFA began exploration of its importance in the profession, we find ourselves today still needing uh, to offer opportunities for people not only to buy into the tenets, but to <coughs> understand then what to do. Sally Ride said they cannot do what they cannot see in talking about people in public administration. And if walking in an unfamiliar neighborhood uh, makes you nervous or uncomfortable, so might articulating a strategy and a set of practices that will institutionalize social equity. So today I have the pleasure of introducing to you three innovative, committed, uh, and real leaders of pu in, in public administration who will tell us how they incorporated social equity into their organization's professional routines and management practices. Public administrators who are using their superpowers uh, to make social equity a professional uh, responsibility and to show those who may not know yet how to do it what one can do. By learning from them, those of you who are doing this work are leading in the profession uh, and might emphasize the social purposes uh, of, their, of their work and their role, uh, as George Fredrickson talked to us about. Uh, the why question are what they can answer for us. Uh, and in closing, their work will help you see what you as an administrator can do. So with that as a brief introduction, I'd like to have our panelists come forward. They will come forward in the order that they are seated. And Sarah Rosen Wartell will start off talking about the challenge of changing organizational culture. Sarah. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Um, uh, I have the great honor and privilege of being the president of the Urban Institute, uh, along with a number of fellows, including uh, Nani Coloretti, and I see a new is here, and I see one of our new inductees today, Margaret Sims, I'm very excited, and there, I'm sure there are others here as well. Um, and Urban just celebrated its 50th anniversary, created in 1968 to bring the power of knowledge to solve the problems that lay heavy on the hearts and minds of Americans the problem of the American city and its people. And as we celebrated our 50th anniversary, we thought deeply about this question of social equity. Um, and we, in fact, reaffirmed our commitment to pursuing through all of our work three core values. Um, our goal of expanding opportunity, closing inequities, and developing a kind of prosperity that is shared. 
And I'm just going to spend one minute sort of stepping back from the problem definition to talk about the moment in which we're uh, working on those sets of issues, all of us together. Um, we live at a time in which the pace of change is um, as fast as it has uh, ever been, perhaps. And one of the challenges in our country has always been that when um, change has come, it generally moves us forward. And while it's a little hard to feel confident in that at this moment, I think history probably shows that even dizzying and difficult periods of change ultimately bring new opportunities for our country. Um, but the process of change and the transitions can be excruciatingly painful. And when you lay on, and we don't always do such a good job of absorbing uh, those change and helping people through it. And when you lay upon that the unfinished business that our country has of its own vast inequities, particularly on the basis of race and ethnicity, but also gender and other forms of difference, uh, it's a particularly challenging moment. Some of the forces of change that are acting to make this so difficult, we know certainly globalization, uh, uh, accelerating demographic change, but also think of technology and climate change. And just um, a, a couple of examples. We all know that the economy itself is changing in ways that increasingly we see a return to the um, uh, contributions of those who bring unique skills and high levels of education uh, to their work and less and less return for those who perform um, uh, uh, normal and usual tasks. And as a result, your chiropractor may always be able to lay hands on you, but there are many in our society whose jobs maybe once interpreting your MRI or your x-ray, was maybe going to uh, move overseas to a technician um, in a foreign land. And today, we have to worry about whether a machine will be the best at analyzing that role. So we're going through a profound structural change <coughs> in our economy. Um, and like many other changes, the great fear, the great risk, is that these changes actually will have the effect of hardening the inequalities that we are now already have in our, in our economy, making it harder to move forward rather than to go back. Uh, two examples of that. If you think about climate change and the task of adapting, assume it's going to happen to some degree, it is happening to some degree already, in our cities, um, Ultimately, I believe that a place like Miami, where it has a tax base and resources, is going to be able to find ways to help its residents um, live differently in a world that will, um, whose environment will be different. But a place like Homestead, just a few miles away, doesn't have the resources to adapt in that way to the challenges that climate change faces. Similarly, we are all excited about the ways that AI is going to change decision making. And just to think about employment for a second, maybe these tools can help us find people who might not have the credential, but might have the ability to be able to do the tasks we want. But those same algorithms and systems can also, they're built on predicting patterns that are based on observations of the past, and our past has in it some of the worst forms of inequities built in. And so the structures that define our society that are, make racism in particular so hard for us are, could be built into those technologies in ways that make it even more difficult to assume. So those are the tasks that I think we're going to talk about today. And let me just mention two things that I think are important for public administration, for important for my institution, and we can talk about them more later as we think about moving forward. The first is that we have different partners. When the Urban Institute was formed, we were told to think about, you know, getting our really important research reports in the hands of some federal agency heads or 535 members of Congress, or uh, perhaps you want to reach um, the people who run the relevant agencies in states and cities around the country. But the today, who's doing the moonshots? With our current confidence in the federal government, the big changes are coming from philanthropy, sometimes the private sector, social movements of all kinds. That means as we think about this problem of social equity, we also have potentially new partners. But the theory of influence, how you 
build coalitions to make change is much more complicated. The second thing I wanted to have us think about is um, uh, for too long, many of us in this space have thought about how we can help someone else. And increasingly, I see the most interesting and exciting things happening in government and in all of these change movements as happening along with the very people that we're trying to serve. Um, in our world of doing social policy research, that means that we don't design the question by in a room to think about how we want to influence someone's life. We sit down with the community that we're trying to do work on and we design the questions because they have insights we do not have. Lived experience is a form of evidence too. And we not only design the research in some cases with them, but we bring them along to help collect the evidence, and then we bring them to the table to help us understand what that evidence tells us. Not everything, of course, we're, but it is an evolving process, community participatory research. And government, increasingly, I just was on a committee of the Bloomberg um, Engage Cities Award, where we lifted up cities that were doing decision making in a different way, not with some consultation and input and focus groups, but actually involving the relevant communities. So thinking more about a much more distributed form of influence and who we partner with and how we make choices is one of the challenges that if we're going to take social equity seriously, we need to tackle in our work. Thank you. Thank you Sarah, very much. That's great, Sarah. At the uh, Kettering Foundation, we talk about democratic practices where citizens name and frame and deliberate and work together with public institutions and other citizens uh, to address in our case, wicked community problems. So fantastic, thank you so much. And I have the pleasure now of introducing Courtney Phillips. And Courtney's gonna talk to us about the challenge of incorporating social equity in service delivery. Courtney. Thank you. Ooh. Sorry. Well, thank you. First, thank you to the Academy for allowing me to participate in this. I think it's so important that we continue to bridge the gap between academia and practice. And also to the staff of the Academy who, who gracefully puts this on every year. There's always a lot of work that goes beyond these events um, and that we always don't seem to acknowledge sometimes. So I do want to appreciate you and your team for pulling these things off for us and allowing us to have these conversations in a safe place to be able to explore the possibilities. For each of us, the pursuit to create full and equal access to opportunities for all people that enable them to reach their full potential is something that I want and that many of you strive for in your daily work each and every day. But the conversations that we've been engaging in in terms of social equity, health equity, equity across the system would make one think that this is a new phenomenon. When in fact, as I mentioned, this is something that we have been grappling with in our society for more than decades. And so what's new about it? What warrants the conversation to push further? The acknowledgement that we all know we have more to do. And so I commend the Academy for taking this and accepting it as a grand challenge and, and, and having the courageous conversation to being committed to this over time. Because as we all know that it will take time, it has taken time and it will continue to take time to move forward. So before I jump into it, I want us to remember in terms of what, what makes up the grand challenge. Large in scope, requires significant innovation, requires long-term commitment, seeks to achieve worthwhile ambitious goals while requiring a paradigm shift. And it has significant individual, governmental, and societal impacts. So how does social equity the grand challenge itself actually intersect with the service delivery. And I, I fortunately have the ability and, and the honor of serving as the executive commissioner for the Texas Health and Human Services in the state of Texas. And that's an entity that serves, uh, has a team of over 41,000 individuals serving our team and a budget of over $80 billion in a biennial budget. And so for me, having the opportunity to serve in that role and understanding where we fit in in terms of the government and the delivery of services and what does that look like for equity, particularly health equity, from my lens, is critical to the conversation. On the practice side, particularly from a government aspect, we so often focus our work in terms of reducing the inequities that exist, almost the treatment side of things. So when we think of healthcare, so often we're focused on treating the disease versus the prevention of the disease. And it's very similar in terms of the social equities when we apply that lens to it. That we're looking at how do we focus on what currently exists in our society today. And we do that. We have numerous programs in the state of Texas across the nation that really focuses on how do we lessen the gap in terms of equities. And that's important work that has to continue. 
But one of the things that I want us to look at is how do we reduce it and eliminate it on the front end? And one of the, the panels that we had today talking about social equity focused and honed in on that in terms of the number one area of looking at. How do we focus on it from the front end? And I think we're making progress on it by the sheer fact that we're having these conversations. And again, we've been having them for decades. But think about now how often you hear some of those buzz terms. Social equity, social inequity, health equity, health inequity, social determinants of health, physical determinants of health, health disparities. They go on and on, and they're more prevalent and relevant now than they ever have been. And so we want to make a change. Now is the time to be effortlessly in putting that forward. But we can't just talk about it. We have to be about it. We can't just research it. We have to actually put the things that we learn and research into practice. And so these conversations and these elements continue to bridge that gap for that. And so we need to look at it not just on the delivery of service side, but on the front end, creating the policy. What does it look like for policy development, the implementation, as well as the evaluation of the programs that we put in place? And so when we begin to look at that, before we actually get to the service delivery side, what does it look like for the procurement of services? After we look at the development of the implementation and the evaluation, what does it look like for a state government to procure those services? Who's procuring it? Who are we procuring it from? Do we have diversity at the table when we're doing that? Then we move on to the service delivery of it. And again, our focus typically in government has been on closing the gap or reducing the gap that currently exists in society. And those, again, are worthwhile efforts that we have to do. So being in the great state of Texas, where my agency directly touched more than 7 million lives on a monthly basis, and currently being ranked second in the nation as having the most diverse, racially diverse, and ethnically diverse state in the nation, we have a great opportunity. Um, I've been in this role last month, made my one year anniversary. Um, I came from Nebraska, so the great folks in Nebraska are the ones who nominated me and got me involved in Napa. And I'm thankful for that, because I get to tap into them all the time. But this past year has allowed me to learn a little bit more about our organization and health organizations across the, the, the nation. So prior to serving in Texas, I served in the Nebraska Department of Health and uh, Human Services, prior to that in the Louisiana Department of Health and Human Services. And while every state is different, every agency is different, this problem exists in every single one of them. Not just the three that I served, but in every one within our nation, it exists. And so what does that really look like? This past month, we at Texas HHS released our first annual HHS business plan. And what that looks like is we set our initiatives for the past, for the coming year in terms of here's our focus, because we can't do everything. We try to do everything, but then we don't do a good job at doing it. So we identified 12 initiatives, 72 goals within those initiatives, and 337 deliverables that tie up to that. And they range across the board in terms of what we focus on. Women, mothers, children, behavioral health, disabilities, all of it, you name it, it's in there. But one of the things that we do focus on in there are the inequalities that exist within our system. And so some of those things include when we're looking at prenatal care and access to service, how do we do a better job of accessing prenatal care? Not just for women in general, but also using the data to dissect in terms of where do we really have a problem and that we can do better. Not just race, not just age, but geographic location across the spectrum, we have to do a better job of using that information. And so we're continuing to focus on those efforts, again, closing the gap on the, the end that exists, that currently exists. We also are looking at adding in more prevention, something that we sometimes don't do on the healthcare sector because we're so busy treating the current disease that exists. So another element that's outlined in our business plan is examples in terms of how do we reduce the number of unintended births? For example, using LARC, Long Active Reversible Contraceptives. So there's a number of layers in there. The thing that I'm most excited about is the third element of that in terms of equity. How do we take a look within our agency of what's important for our team and embedding it in the culture? Because I'm not going to be in this seat forever. You all know that as administration changes, so do the seats. And I could do a mandate in my department, but that will do nothing when I'm no longer there unless it's embedded in the culture. And so that takes time, but we don't always have time in our seats. And so how do we get the right people at the table, the right partnerships, and understanding who those partners are? Because historically, we like to work within our organization. We don't like to always go external. But we have to go external, working with legislative members, working with academia, working with philanthropic organizations, and bringing them to the table and bringing those perspectives. And so while we focused on the treatment prevention, now we need to look at in terms of what have we been doing that has actually contributed to that health equity gap? What policies have we put in place that have contributed to that? And we might have some really good policies that provide services that are needed, but do we have things in place, written and unwritten, that have created a greater gap that we need to go back and look at? 
Have we done that look back? We don't, because we're moving forward trying to provide treatment for the services and the problem that exists, creating a new program for the new problem that has exists, the new crisis. But we don't ever go back to look at what has been put in place, both written and unwritten, that adds to that. And so one of the things that we have highlighted in our business plan is that we want to create that culture. One, where our team members understand we build a foundation on cultural competency, that we thread it throughout our organization, that we go back and we look at our policies and regs to understand what we have done and what's our role in creating that gap. And how do we eliminate it on the front end? And those things look at everything from rulemaking, of getting feedback in terms of not just the process of the rules and the benefit to society, but do we have an element in the rule that we're proposing in the policy that leads to a greater gap in equity? We want to know that. That's something we haven't done before. I want to know my advisory committees in terms of the representation of the individuals we serve and that have, are feeling the inequity. I want them on my advisory boards. I need them helping to guide and be a part of that conversation. As we're looking at our utilization and the procurement of services, I need the diversity at the table in terms of who will be delivering those services understanding what is their perspective at the point of delivery so we can factor that into our policies and programs implementation and then building off the work that has been done in academia we don't have all the expertise internally in terms of government in terms of doing the data analysis and the collection and dissecting of where we are and building those recommendations we don't need to trip over each other in the different sectors we need to understand how do we complement each other on that spectrum and how do we take those inform that information and apply it to our everyday practice and so those are some of the things we're doing in the great state of Texas um, coming forward. I look forward to sharing with you all uh, maybe next year in terms of the efforts that we have. But I think it's, it, it's we, we must look at how do we bridge the gap between theory and practice to make a difference and a dent in equity. And it can't just be the focus on the services on the back end. We have to start looking at it, our policies and program creation in order how do we make that change on the front end. While we're stitching the wound, we need to go ahead and stop the spread of it. So thank you guys. I now have the pleasure of introducing Darren Atterbury, who is going to talk about the challenges unique to making social equity that third pillar. And as a city manager on the front lines and engaging and working with politicians and community activists and citizens that really just want uh, government to work for them and their community, uh, you're going to tell us how you can incorporate social equity, a tall, tall charge. But uh, Darren, thanks so much for your willingness Thank to do you. this. Oh. Thank you very much. Well, I was just sitting here thinking while our prior speakers were speaking, um, what, <clears throat> excuse me, what value can I add here? And I, I think what I was thinking about is just want to let you know that at the local government level, small and medium-sized U.S. cities, um, we are dealing with these issues. We are, um, in the context of all the national conversation that's going on, which can oftentimes be very, very difficult and very infuriating for people and, and provocative and all those sorts of things, I think what I'm seeing in my role as a city administrator, as a city manager, is that on Tuesday night at 6 o'clock, um, the way in downtown Fort Collins, the way that this is coming to fruition is people are coming down to their city halls and they're talking to their local elected representatives. And they're, you know, at that, at that Main Street level are um, expressing their excitement, their joy, their frustrations and so forth. And so um, also before I begin, I want to just say I, I was reflecting on the grand challenges. I was looking at, the, looking at that work, and I think it's incredibly relevant um, at all levels of government, and in particular at, local, at the local government level. And, and um, I really appreciate that work, and it's, it's, it's significant work. Um, Fort Collins is a community of about 175,000 people. <clears throat> it's about an hour north of Denver along the front range of the Rocky Mountains. It's a university town, Colorado State University. Rams are there, about 35,000 students. Um, it's a full service city. Uh, I have about 2,500 coworkers on a daily basis that, that deliver 24-7, 365 great replicable uh, services every day. Whether it's 911, how can we help? Whether it's the chemistry lab and the water utility or at the cemetery helping families 
with some of the worst times of their of their lives. Um, now, I do want to say that um, the way that the way that I can, um, I guess, just uh, verify for you that that this this conversation that's going on around social equity is actually in our city council adopted priority list. So of the, we had a recent election last April, the city council after that election gets together and they ID their priorities. Of the 20 priorities that they identified for the next two years, 10 of those relate to this topic that we're talking about. So 10 of the 20 adopted, I was a little disappointed they didn't put police services and fire in there, but we can, we'll, we'll get through that. <laughs> but let me just, just share a little bit about uh, some of those topics. Affordable and accessible childcare, um, low income benefit rebate, streamlining and consolidation and access, uh, equity and inclusion, mobile home park preservation and resident protections, affordable and achievable housing strategies, equitable participation in culture and recreation programs, encourage uh, increase of our, of our transit system we call transport, the use and the access, and just overall accessibility. Reimagine community engagement where all voices are heard, where um, folks that have been underrepresented for, for a long time have uh, as much access as I do and my family does. And then, um, oh, and reimagining boards and commissions. Uh, we have 29 boards and commissions in our city, and um, the representation can be um, much better, much more diverse, and uh, so we're working on that. And then another one that is taking a very significant amount of our time is back uh, last November, after about three or four years of study, our um, voter, the community, voted on building a municipal broadband utility. So as I mentioned earlier, we're a full service city. We have electric, water, wastewater, stormwater, and now broadband. Uh, that is not something that we just said, hey, let's go in and compete with, with uh, the private sector and Comcast and CenturyLink. Let's, that wasn't our intent. Our intent was to do two things with that initiative. One was to future-proof Fort Collins as it relates to the digital, just um, the presence of, of uh, gig speed broadband, uh, what we call symmetrical broadband. And second of all, to significantly address the issue of digital divide. And so it does not matter in Fort Collins, we're, this is about a 36-month journey, about a $140 million investment. We're pulling about 1,000 miles of fiber optics uh, throughout our community over the next three years to every single property in the community. Whether you live in my neighborhood or whether you live in a, a mobile home park on North College. And by the way, the, the economic models are not so good. Um, they're not so profitable to build to the mobile home park on North College. Because you gotta go under a river and you gotta go um, you know, way out of the way. And we know that there are significant low income customers in that area. So it's not really been addressed over the years. And so in my neighborhood, I have great access to, to, to relatively high speeds. When our broadband utility is in place, I'll have great access to fiber op direct fiber optic service at an affordable rate. But so will the person who lives in a mobile home park uh, across North College. And, and here's the thing also that I'm super proud of is that they won't, um, we won't dumb down the speeds because they're low income people. Um, we're gonna get, provide full gig service no matter where you are, no matter what geographic area you are in the community. We'll have affordable rates in different areas, but um, I'm really, really proud of my community for, for doing that. Future proofing and digital divide. What we also know with digital divide though, it's not just running fiber in front of people's homes or in their neighborhoods. It's giving them access to the gear that then gives them the connectivity. And then when you give the access to the gear, you've got to also give training. And, and so what we're really talking about is a, is, a, is a sort of a full portfolio of not just running fiber at an affordable rate, but, but giving people the tools to be very successful. Um, I want to say that, um, whoops, as I mentioned, you know, it is, these equity conversations are playing out at the local level. I know many of you have participated at the federal and state levels, but I'm, um, you know, my colleagues, other public administrators or policymakers, city managers 
are really leaning into this conversation. What we're really trying to do is figure out how to take the, the academic research, what in our DNA and our instincts we know is right, um, what various community members are saying and trying to, trying to, operationalize, it, to, trying to operationalize it into um, uh, relationships, our communication strategies, trying to um, uh, you know, af understand how it affects our transportation delivery and our, and our pricing of, of various services that provide um, access to parks and recreation programs and, and on and on and on. Um, I will tell you that I also believe that, that um, uh, for me as a city manager, and I've been in this industry for a little over 30 years, um, yeah, it's always been a topic that, that, that we've talked about, but really in the last three to five years for me and in my role, it's been, it's been a, a complete game changer. It actually has, I'm learning so much and my colleagues are learning so much and what it's really done is, is gotten me to rethink you know, how I lead and how I lead a workforce of 2,400 people, 2,500 people, but um, again, we're not serving seven million customers. We're just serving a little town of about 170, 75,000 people. But I think it's, um, I think it's having a, a dramatic impact on a lot of us. And then I think also one of the specific um, tools that I think, or maybe self-awareness, is just the need to be nimble and the need to be authentic in our conversations. Crazy thing is having been the city manager for Fort Collins for about 15 years and prior to that an assistant for about eight years, so 23, 24 years in the community. Crazy thing is until about a year ago, I had never met with a mobile home park population. We have over 3,000 people that live in mobile home parks in our community. And uh, I'd never, I'd never, I mean, I've met with the Chamber of Commerce, I've met with developers, I've met with all kinds of different um, groups, but um, but these are folks who are really what we're what we're really doing. I think is getting really much better at, at trying to understand our service uh, levels, and then also trying to understand um, how we engage in a way that gives people voices that haven't haven't uh, had voices for a long time. So um, I'll end with that, and hopefully that provokes some further conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's give a real welcoming NAPA thank you uh, to our three panelists. Thank you. And Sarah, as you know, I'm going to start with you. And okay. the uh, question that I would like to ask you is, can you elaborate on the power coming from new places, state and local government, uh, advocates, corporations, you know, what does that look like and, and, and what can you talk to us more about? Well, I, I, I think it's important to understand that, I mean, I can imagine that uh, within a city there's a traditional set of actors that you've always had there. The, um, the business community has always had a certain amount of voice. There's people in the elected government and the like. But one of the things that technology has given is it's distributed power, authority, power, voice, so much more widely across our society. Um, I think about it from our perspective, when the Urban Institute was created, you know, our business model could be that if we had influence to uh, elected agency heads, et cetera, that was enough. Well, today, sometimes the people who we may be wanting to influence, we want to pick up the ideas that come from our work, you know, it could be uh, the Black Lives Matters activists, or the Parkland students, or Jose Andres and the way he's changed the conversation about food, um, or Larry Fink, who has told every company that they need to, be, for investors to have confidence, they need to be thinking about how they affect their all of their stakeholders and not just their shareholders, or um, uh, the Koch brothers, or um, the tech philanthropists. Those folks have a, you know, at and the the. Groups in a community who can use social media to catch on. So at every level of our society, power, I think, is much more widely distributed. That can be great. It means that some of the voices that we were talking about before, not having a seat at the table, can potentially get a seat at the table. 
but it also means who can command voice, who can get the access to the uh, institutions that reach others. That creates an advantage for those with wealth. Mem many of the people that I mentioned on that list who ha are as influential as any governor or senator are also people who've had great success in their private lives. And some of us, you know, my institution works with many of those philanthropists and corporations as well as government agencies and, and traditional foundations. And some question whether there's too much power and voice in the hands of some. So it's a very, it's a much more complicated environment to bring about social change. And if you think the dynamics I've just described are global, but you could imagine that in, a, in those same dynamics in a city too. Um, and so we have to be able to reach many more people with our insights. You have to write in a way that's accessible. You need to use digital media, but both government agencies do. We've been working with police forces, helping them evaluating who's using social media well for community policing. Um, but at the same time, you also need to be able to uh, communicate to people with much different goals and roles in society, which means we really have to think harder about what we're trying to accomplish. Thank you. And Courtney, can you give us an example of one of the challenges you faced as you look to integrate social equity within the service delivery uh, culture of uh, the human uh, health and human services in Texas? Absolutely. I think, as we all know, culture change is a, is a change that's very complicated and takes time. And so I think that is one of the things to overcome of building it into the organization at its forefront not just on the surface level in terms of just the delivery of service, but how do you build it again into the fabric? And so understanding where the organization is, acknowledging where you are, the business plan that we put out there was our public commitment that we know we have work to do, but we are committed to doing that work, again, not just on the provision of service, but how we look at it from our lens at the department's level. Again, looking at it from the policy perspective, looking at it in front of the procurement of service perspective, looking at it in our engagement of the community, not just our stakeholders internally, but our stakeholders across the system and bringing the right people to the table. We have stakeholders who have been committed to our agency, but we also we know have, we have stakeholders who have not had a voice historically in making sure that they are at the table and we understand what their needs are and what the barriers are and what things that we have put in place that may have caused a greater barrier. And so the delivery of service is one piece that we're focusing on, but the cultural piece in terms of building that into the organization on the forefront is a critical piece that we're working to overcome. Fantastic, thank you. And Darren, how might state and local government, public professionals, city managers, integrate the concepts and the principles of social equity into their professional routines, the, the work they do every day? What I realized, Valerie, is I didn't, a I didn't answer the question when I came up about um, what we call the triple bottom line. Or, um, a number of years ago, the way that we sort of began to operationalize the idea of sustainability, which is, not just the financial health of your city, but the environmental health and the social health as well. And notice I'm not saying economic development and, and um, our uh, community and the way that you know, I sort of uh, operationalized that was to create a service area within our organization. It's made up of about probably 30 to 40 people. So it's a reasonable sized group of folks that are doing mighty work. But um, when we're looking at the when we're looking at the the financial health or the economic health of the community, the environmental health and social, you know, I, I think small to medium sized cities in the past decades haven't really dealt haven't had to deal a lot with the social health of their community. We've relied on the federal government and on the state governments to do a lot of that. So this is sort of new work for us. But um, so having the last probably five plus years of that structure has really, I think, awakened and provoked learning and um, curiosity, which then translates to our ability to really affect change. So I think the way, so to answer your question, I, I think it's really important um, that we are data informed in the work that we're doing. I think the idea of uh, the city of Fort Collins is the fourth largest business in our community. So how are we acting as an employer? How are we engaging with folks? Um, I think about many programs around train the trainer. So um, are, we, are we leading by example, those kinds of things. But um, you know, I also think about in a community when you have a city, you know, cities don't build communities. Cities co-create communities with 
K-12 and with universities and for-profit and philanthropy and non-for-profit. So I think um, recognizing that we're gonna, not going to solve the problem alone is really, really important. Fantastic. Thank you. We would now like to open it up for questions. Any questions? Well, while you are thinking about what you might want to ask, I will just have you, uh, Darren, talk about the Fort Collins Way. The Fort Collins Way? <laughs> um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. Your, your, your employees have come to the foundation and they've talked about there oh. as a culture within the community oh. uh, that the voice of citizens would also be heard. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for that. I didn't expect that question. I wasn't exactly sorry, sure I what you're referring to. to. Um, uh, well, first of all, uh, as I've said to you offline, Valerie, thank you for the Kettering Foundation. My colleagues who have spent time with you, and in fact, our mayor has spent a little bit of time with your organization as well. We are getting better in this. We are getting better as communicators because of your foundation. I really appreciate that. I think that, you know, for me, I, I think about um, we we're, we talk a lot about world class municipal services, and and sometimes people roll their eyes about that. But um, let's not aspire to be average. Let's actually, and call it best in class, call it whatever you want. Um, my wife says don't use world class because the mayonnaise in our refrigerator, refrigerator says world class. So, so um, but, but, but let's not aspire to be average. And, and let's also be very intentional about how we're engaging with folks so that, so that um, we have lots of answers, but we don't have all the answers. And this idea of co-creation has really it really is part of our DNA and, and culture as an organization. I'm really proud of that. And and what's kind of fun as the executive leader of that is to uh, sometimes to be able to watch the the momentum or the flywheel um, and and that um, you were talking about. I think sustainable. You know, at some point we lead and um, we have to drive change. And when you see the momentum mm -hmm. and the and the flywheel moving. Um, it's an incredibly rewarding place, but more importantly, it's a, it's a results-driven organization, not just a, you give us your fees, taxes, fines, and charges, and trust us, we'll deliver a local, lo great local government. It's a results-driven um, uh, local government. So I hope that helps. Fantastic, thank you. And you are our thank first uh, question. I'm a new fellow. Um, <laughs> thank you to the panelists, all four of you, for really a tremendously inspiring view of the world. And I. Not to be a downer, I guess I want to ask, <laughs> why don't we hear more of this? Uh, and, and, and I really do commend the Academy for focusing on this issue for the way that you've framed it. It's obviously something that every institution at every level has to focus on. I, worked at, I work at an old, elite, you know, very white, et cetera, kind of institution, and we're working on all this. But I, I, I'm just really struck by hearing the, the views of the world that you all have and the positive views of the world that all of you have and the, the, the path that you've charted that is so uh, um, optimistic, uh, forthright but optimistic, and, and the world that I think a lot of the rest of the country or the image that we have of a lot of the rest of the country that is, I would almost say the, the mirror image of this, it's all of what isn't what you're talking about. It's all of the, the righteous anger and acrimony and resentment and everything else and without a sense of how to get to where you're talking about. So I'm, I'm really just interested in how, uh, how do we get more of you? Uh, <laughs> and and, and, and how, how does, how, how do, is, is, are, are we just living in a, a very kind of negative uh, world view where actually you represent the truth or, or are we, or is it the opposite or, or what is it? So I'm, I'm just interested in where, where we go from, from the views Sarah? that you've put out. So Danny's a friend, but I have to, that's a hard question. Um, so a couple thoughts. I think the, the reality is both worlds are true simultaneously. Um, I go every, insti uh, you know, think of legacy institution that I have any uh, thing to deal with from the universities that I know and touch to the local government to are, are going through a profound <laughs> understanding that 
um, you know, we aren't done on a set of our, um, particularly around race and gender, the, the equity issues that we've had in our society. We're not even close to done. We wanted to pretend for a while that maybe we were, but we are not at all. And in fact, we baked these um, historical disadvantages into our, our, our DNA. And that it's not enough to sort of like work on composition a little bit. You actually have to work on content of what you do and how you do it in order to be able to really look at the questions in a real and true way. And that means you need to be um, much more attentive to the language you use and what prejudgments you may have just baked into how you have conversations. Every institution I know is doing that. Second thing is that at the local level, at the state government level, pragmatism rather than polarization is much um, more the dominant. Not that it isn't there too, but I get happy when I leave Washington and go to cities or states and talk to partners who regardless of party are working on the same sets of issues to improve the efficacy of government, to make their services work better, et cetera. Um, so all of that is optimistic and impossible. But we also live in a world in which the lives in Southwest Ohio um, much more daunting challenges than the lives of people who get to live and can afford to live in high growth cities, particularly on the coast. Um, and, and we don't have any ready answers to solve that. So my last bit of hope is that, um, uh, I could use opioids as an example or the labor market as an example. The challenges that, let's use opioids, the cha people act as though the opioid crisis is some brand new crisis that just happened because it has uh, emerged in a lot of, um, let's be honest, white communities around our country. Um, but the reality is the scourge of different types of drug use and the way they, as a public health challenge, affected lots of communities. Well, is there a possibility for us to start to see the commonality of life experience that people have in the challenge of addiction and its, uh, um, the ways in which it reflects a kind of despair about opportunity. And maybe in some of these great difficult challenges we face, there's also some opportunity for us to find shared experience and shared aspiration. I will add too that it's important for us to remember that sometimes people really have the right to be angry and I think about conversations earlier today when we discussed a systems approach to social <coughs> equity. And I reflect on my days as a city manager in a community where the council uh, kind of is the last point of uh, frustration for many people who don't have elite access uh, to, to resources, to influencers, uh, and to uh, initiate change. And, and when you think about a person who has tried every other means to get a local issue resolved, uh, with no success, they bare their soul in the three minutes they have to speak before the elected council, uh, whose members are generally writing or talking uh, or texting and paying them absolutely no attention. And then we wonder why they're angry and they're frustrated and that the level of mistrust uh, is growing between citizens uh, and elected officials. So sometimes we need to look at our own practices and policies and procedures uh, to see if there are small things we can do uh, that could make a huge difference in the way citizens see their government and of course in the way governments interact with their citizens. Uh, and we have a couple of speakers. May I ask, we, may I add one more uh, yes, and yes, please. So Courtney. I think you, you answered that you asked the question in terms of how do we get more and is this the look of opportunity. I think it's a look of opportunity but also the look of if not you, who? And so for me, if not me, who will do it? Um, and there's many of us who will do it. And so how do we get more? I think the opportunities in this room, when we look at um, the administrators and, and entities that produce public administrators who are coming to my agency and other state agencies and other local government agencies, it would be great that they are ready day one in terms of social equity. Right now, I have to go back and get our team up to speed on social equity. So the more that we can produce and embed that in, in the front end, when they enter into those government agencies, they are ready and they can question the why we have been doing something in this manner. Why does this policy say this? How does this policy impact that particular individual? Um, and so I think, I think it starts with groups like this, and then how do we train others and making sure they are ready on day one to challenge the current system? And so a challenge for you as a new fellow. Uh, <laughs> here, yes, behind Anthony. 
Yes, please. Yeah, uh, Louis Uccellini, uh, Director of the Weather, uh, National Weather Service. So, you know, after going through about two or three changes, we, we learned that cultural barriers really are the, one of the biggest obstacles to change. But uh, one of the speakers mentioned the, the, the term hidden bias, but never really followed up on that. But it seems like we're hearing more about that as being even a, a worse barrier for change. And I think it, you know, in terms of the social equity, in terms of the services provided, I think we're seeing it not just within the way the workforce is managed, but also, also where the attention is put for the services aspect. So I was just wondering if the uh, panelists can talk a little bit about the hidden bias aspect and you know, how that's emerging. I think uh, there's a much deeper question than what I want to respond to. One of the things I was thinking about that, um, and I've, I've recently gone through extensive training around change management. And I think, uh, I, at least for me, as I reflect on my career, I think, you know, I've been through a lot of change, so I say I'm, I, I'm good at change, right? And recently I've been studying the science of change management. We, we know that executive sponsorship matters. If you have strong executive leadership on a change effort, six times greater um, chance of success. Six times greater. The executive role matters a lot. Project management, we're really good at. We have project managers who help with the change. In my experience, where we're really lacking, and companies like ProSci and others would say, is the change management part of it. So it's the executive leadership, the change management, I'm sorry, the project management, which we're really good at, but change management, we're not good at. The science of change management and the, the, the research, and it's, it's compelling. So I guess one of the things I would suggest for leaders in the room that think, um, look to that potentially as a resource. I, I, I think executive leadership matters a lot. Uh, and by the way, to the earlier question, I get accused of being um, Pollyannish and opt overly optimistic, but what's the alternative? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't I, I, but, but I also, you know, I can lay at bed at night and shed tears. So it's not a naive Pollyannish optimism. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a deep core belief that this is good work and that we should continue it and try and build cultures and so forth. But just to the folks in the room who haven't done much work around change management, there is a body of evidence that shows that that is critical. So um, I, don't, I don't think we're super good at that. Mm -hmm. Courtney, I think you may have been the one to mention it. I may, I don't know, may have been me, but you yeah. want to go first? No, I don't. You okay. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I wanted to, to an implicit bias is simply that the way we interact, and others can define it better than I probably, but the way that we interact with others brings a whole set of our own life experiences that may mean we are not, that we're not consciously aware of, and we may be communicating all kinds of things that we're not aware of to others. And um, our institution uh, has not gotten this uh, right yet, but we've been going through a very painful journey. And it's uh, ultimately one that is very healthy. And the, the phrase I like to use comes from Brian Stevenson, who wrote a fabulous book that's soon to be a movie called Just Mercy. Um, uh, and um, the phrase is, get com is about the importance of being comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, if an, uh, we recently did a culture survey of our staff, a workplace culture survey, and what we found, as one might expect, if you ask people, do you feel comfortable being your own true self in this organization? Can you bring all of the insights that your life experience um, brings you to the conversation of how you do your work with your peers? Surprisingly, uh, uh, not surprisingly, uh, people of color, women, LGBTQ, et cetera, m often feel much less confident that they are really invited to bring their experiences to the table. Because if they do, they may need to make uh, others, in many cases often the leadership of the organizations, uncomfortable. So it's incumbent on the leaders to say that you're going to be okay being made uncomfortable, be okay being told that what you're doing or the way, the way you are talking about an issue seems to imply an assumption about another group of people that you shouldn't bring, always expect. So they're leading, being a good leader in a time of change means being willing to have a lot of people tell you that they think what you're doing isn't right 
and say to them, that's okay, I want to learn about that. And there are, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, we can all go to uh, implicit bias training and lots of those are the things and those are very valuable. But to your point, I think earlier, that it's about culture change in your institution. One of the most important culture changes is creating an environment in which people can challenge one another and how they behave in the workplace. Because if you bring all those experiences, we'll be much better at the content of service and uh, provision for all of our citizens. Okay. I know that the time is winding down. I saw four hands still that we haven't had a chance to get to. So I'm going to ask if you would quickly state your question and then we'll ask the uh, panelists to respond in kind to all three. And Anthony and Blue and behind Anthony at the table there and then all the way in the back. So Anthony. My message is for Courtney being a fellow Texan. <laughs> knowing how, how large your agency is, 38,000 folks, how do you ensure that the so social equity message resonates throughout the state of Texas for your HHS employees, but more importantly, reaches them in light of this large bureaucratic uh, agency. And because sometimes they look at it as the flavor of the month and that this too shall pass. So what are the efforts that you're doing to make sure that resonates? And I know there's a mic circulating around the room. Blue is sitting over here. Uh, Blue, you were next, if you would uh, not mind. Um, thank you, Valerie. I'm Blue Wolfridge, and actually I wanted to respond to your question, uh, your point right there. Um, for, for nine years, I had the pleasure of serving as chair of the Standing Panel on Social Equity and Governance. So to answer your question, where c can you see more of this, I encourage all of the new fellows to get involved with the standing panel in social equity and governance under the new leadership of Gary Glickman. Uh, we have frequent meetings. You can uh, participate by uh, uh, telecommunication as well as coming into town. But, and also in addition, the National Academy co-sponsors a standalone social equity leadership conference. This year it's going to be at the Humphrey School uh, June 10th through the, the 12th, and uh, Laura is working putting it together. We encourage all of you to come and participate. And you're going to be hearing not only uh, of these great examples, but so many more and, uh, and possible solutions on how to integrate social equity into public policy. I saw your hand. Are you still interested in making a comment? Uh, uh, if not, we have someone in the back of the room. And that will be our last question. Hi, uh, Jim Savar, Durham, North Carolina. Just in, to follow on with this uh, identification of new resources and new momentum, um, the uh, Government Alliance for Racial Equity, GRRE, uh, has been working with local governments throughout the country and has had about 250 governments that are affiliated with it. Yeah. ICMA, the City, International City and County Management Association, has just announced a strategic partnership with GAR uh, that will now bring those resources and spread them out throughout the whole uh, ICMA organization and membership base. So the momentum is building and for uh, and, and for Napa to make this a strategic challenge as well is another positive sign. Yeah, right on. Okay, and what I'd like to do is ask the panel to respond and offer any closing comments to what you've heard. Absolutely. So I'll jump in since that yeah. one was since you called me out. Uh, I'm just joking. Uh, so. So I'll speak on it just even greater than social equity. Um, and so recently, again, this is my one year anniversary last month, I had the pleasure of jumping in in Texas very close to legislative session. And so I spent six months legislative session, the summer hit the road to try to understand, greater understand our state of Texas. And again, it's about four or five states built into one when you start to understand some of the geographic and differences that are embedded within our state. That, that extends to my organization and the team members across the state. And so the first piece is actually building in that they belong to a part of an organization, that they are not somewhere on their own. That's the first step, even outside of understanding social equity for the provision and our mission in terms of helping people to live a better life. I have to have our team that understand that they are in a part of something much greater than just their particular area and how does that fit in in terms of where we're headed. The business plan was one aspect of that. That's why we do it. So team members across the state understand what are our priorities over the first year how are we going to challenge those? What is our baseline? Where do we want to be at the end of the fiscal year? And how do we get there? 
and how do you fit in from your particular role, whether you're providing a direct service, whether you're a supervisor, whether you're a manager, or whether you're an executive team, how do you play a part into that and then shaping that organization to go that. It's not just me directing in terms of here's what we're going to do, it's feedback from across the organization. So part of what we see in our business plan is the feedback that I got from my team on the road over the last three months in terms of here's what we want to do, here's what's important to us, and this is what we want to help, we want you to help be a representation of this. I'm just one person in our organization, I represent our organization organization, but my 41,000 plus employees are also representations of our organization. And so building brand ambassadors who can actually take that word out and travel throughout the organization. That's part of it. So you could be one of those too. Yeah. <laughs> our system is much bigger than just HHS. I tap everybody. I could, could you imagine having 41,000 employees? I always say if you can get everyone in one town. <laughs> if, 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 if you can get everyone in one conference room, that's a beautiful thing. You, you have to run out of state. <laughs> um, for me, if I may, I just um, one, one thing that we haven't, we haven't really even touched on is the value of elected leadership. Um, you know, I represent public or, uh, uh, city management, but I think about the significance of this shared leadership model between the mayor and the city council and, and, and executive leadership in cities. It matters a lot. Um, I appreciate Jim mentioning GEAR. I would second that. They're a great resource. I think ICMA, National League of Cities, race equity and leadership work that they've done over the last few years has been fabulous for Fort Collins. The Human Rights Campaign, which is the LBGTQ AI Plus community, um, they are a DC non for profit. They've been fabulous um, uh, uh, resource for us. My, my final words would be um, sort of self-awareness, um, lean in, and stay curious. Fantastic, very good. Perfect way to land. I'm happy to, <laughs> to leave it there, but uh, I think the fact that Napa has taken up this challenge mm -hmm. uh, for this organization, which um, so many of the people here uh, have had great careers and to be part of saying what's important to the next generation of people uh, as they are taking their public administration careers is an important step. So thank you for helping organize us. Thank you very much and thank all of you for your active participation. I would now like to invite Teresa to step forward and tell us what's next. <laughs> Before you leave, Teresa's going to tell us what's oh, next. No, oh, no, okay. it's okay. Uh, what a great discussion, and what a place to end our conversation for today, to be so clearly reminded of why fostering social equity is a grand challenge in and of itself, but it is a part of every other grand challenge that we face, and to think about it on the front end instead of on the back end. Um, and so I really want to thank all of you for your insight, for your inspiration, and for reminding us that this is not a problem that can't be solved, but it does take all of us. So one more round of applause for our... <laughs> yep, we're going to take your chairs. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was fabulous. Do you want us to get these off? Oh, we got a team. All right. Because we have a multifunctional team at the Academy. <laughs> All right, so we are going to turn next to our induction for the Fellows Class of 2018. This ceremony culminates a year-long effort on the part of you, our current Fellows, to identify, nominate, sponsor, and vote on a group of outstanding public administrators to add to your ranks. The members of this year's class represent the very best practitioners, academics, and pracademics. They come from all areas of the country and all levels of government, and they have an experience that spans public, private, and nonprofit sectors. I'd like to thank our fellows nominating committee for their diligent attention to this important task, and now I would like to invite the co-chairs of the nominating committee, Barbara Romzek and Nani Coloretti, to the stage to preside over the induction. Good evening. We are going to try to be fast with this, but it's like graduation, so every single um, inductee will come up if you remember your ceremony. I do. Mine was just a few years ago. Um, so we're Nani Colaretti and Barbara Romzek, and we are pleased to be here tonight in our capacity as co-chairs of the Academy Fellows Nominating Committee. 
this year, we continued the fellows nominating process, developed several years ago. It was, it's very comprehensive, and some might say a bit arduous. It's many hours. Go ahead, Barbara. Right. Yeah. So the way we're going to do this, co-chairs do co-chair work. Uh, so I will be introducing uh, the first half. It's just like you have a sign language person. You get tired, we'll turn it over to the, to the next person. Uh, I want to say just a little bit about uh, the process and thank the committee members who did all the work. We had uh, uh, nearly 100 nominations. And so imagine the work all of the people did reviewing 100 nominations before they even got to DC for the two days of looking and deciding who got over the bar. So I want to thank the fellows nominating committee, which included Carol Ebden, Greg Devereaux, uh, Jane Fountain, Robert Lamb, Dave Mader, Pat Martell, Tina Nabachi, Kathy Newcomer, <coughs> excuse me, Jim Perry, uh, Priscilla Regan, Catherine Lucigarud, Kendra Stewart and Dave Winogren. Uh, now, I, I also want to say uh, that the, we all know the lifeblood of any organization is recruiting new members. The people in uh, the National Academy are all accomplished and talented, and the, our newcomers reflect that as well. But what we need to do is to make sure we continue to bring new blood, new talent, new expertise into the organization. So I want to charge each of you to go home and think about who else should be a member of this academy and think about putting a little bit of time and effort in to nominate them next time around. So that's my charge to you as we celebrate those who did get through this rigorous process and, and celebrate their accomplishments. So our first, uh, our first fellow who will come forward will be, is Angela Bailey. She is the Chief Human Capital Officer at the Department of Homeland Security. Our next fellow is uh, Joyce Barr, Professor of Practice, Government and International Affairs at uh, the School of Public and International Affairs at v Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. <laughs> Our next member is Jade Berry James. She is Associate Professor at North Carolina State University School of Public and International Affairs. He's coming late. Next, we have Laura Bloomberg, who is Dean of the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, University of Minnesota. Our next fellow is Leonard Berman. He is the Paul Volcker Professor at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. <laughs> Clarence Crawford is board member of the Maryland State Board of Education. Nicole Darnall is Associate Dean and Professor of Management and Public Policy at the School of Sustainability at Arizona State University. <laughs> Janine Davidson, President of the Metropolitan State University of Denver. Next is Patria delancer Julnes. She is Associate Dean of Academic Programs and Professor of Public Administration at the Austin Marks School of Public and International Affairs at Baruch College. <laughs> Mary Feeney is Professor in the School of Public Affairs at Arizona State University. Uh, 
Uh, Brody Fontenot is adjunct professor at the Key Executive Leadership Program at the School of Public Affairs, American University. Beth Gasly is professor of the Paul H. O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University, Bloomington. <laughs> David Gregan is chief learning officer in the government of the District of Columbia. David Grant is founder and partner of the Potomac Ridge Consulting. Margaret Graves is Deputy Federal Chief Information Officer and Acting Federal Chief Information Officer for the Office of Management and Budget. Stephen Hamill is CEO and founder of the Public Purchasing Exchange, <laughs> LLC. <laughs> Nicholas Hart is Chief Executive Officer of Data Co Coalition. John Hicks, Executive Director of the National Association of State Budget Officers. <laughs> Kay Husband's Feeling is full professor and chair in the School of Public Policy at Georgia Institute of Technology. Javonda Jacobs Young is Administrator of the Agricultural Research Service and Acting Chief Scientist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. <laughs> Michael Jacobson is Deputy Director of the King County Office of Performance, Strategy, and Budget. Jocelyn Johnston is professor in the Department of Public Policy and Administration at the School of Public Affairs at American University. <laughs> Leo Kaiser is director and professor in the Truman School of Public Affairs at the University of Missouri. Ramaya Krishnan is Dean of the Heinz College of Information, Systems, and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. And Sabine Kuhlman is Professor of Political Sciences, Administration, and Organization on the Faculty of Economics and Social Sciences at the University of Potsdam, Germany. up the names. Okay. Um, David Laser is the University Distinguished Professor of Political Science and Computer Sciences at Northeastern University. <laughs> Peter Levine, Senior Fellow, Forces and Resources Division, Institute for Defense Analysis. <laughs> Analyses. <laughs> Jeffrey Liebman, Director, Taubman Center for State and Local Government, Harvard Kennedy School. Is he here? Not here. Okay. We'll clap him anyway. Um, Leonard Lopo, Maxwell Advisory Board Professor of Public Policy, Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs, Syracuse University. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. 
Stan Myberg, Director, of Graduate Studies in Sustainability, Wake Forest University. Our Carl Rethemeyer, Dean, Rockefeller College of Public Affairs and Policy, University of Albany, State University of New York, SUNY. Michelle Sager, Director, Strategic Issues Collaborative Governance, U.S. Government Accountability Office. <laughs> Peggy Sherry, Deputy Chief Financial Officer, U.S. Department of Treasury, Office of Comptroller Currency. <laughs> Patricia Shields, Professor, Political Science, Texas State University. <laughs> Margaret Sims, non-resident fellow, labor, human services and population, Urban Institute. Cedric Sims, Senior Vice President, Justice, Homeland Security and Transportation at Booz Allen Hamilton. <laughs> Anthony Snipes, City Manager, City of Missouri City. City of Missouri. Sokolov, Deputy Associate Director, Research, Markets, and Regulations at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. <laughs> Louis Uccellini, Director, National Weather Service. Greg Van Risen, Professor, School of Public Affairs and Administration, Rutgers University. <laughs> Tracy Waring Evans, President and CEO, American Public Human Services Association. Daniel Weitzner, Founding Director, Internet Policy Research Initiative, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Technology <laughs> MIT. <laughs> Peter Wilcoxon, a halo professor of energy and environmental policy, Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs, Syracuse University. David Williams, Vice Chairman, Board of Governors, U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> Irving Williamson, former Commissioner, U.S. International Trade Commission. <laughs> oh, Adam. Oh, okay. Um, Michael Wooten, Administrator, Office of Federal Procurement Policy, Executive Office of the President. Okay, wondering if we have a latecomer, James Baker. Is he here? I feel like I'm paging him, James Baker. Okay, so I'm going to read you those not in attendance tonight so you can hear their names and applaud them in absentia. James Baker is a new fellow, professor and director of Syracuse University Institute for Security Policy and Law. We also have um, Timothy Gribben, who's the commissioner of the Bureau of Fiscal Service for the U.S. Department of Treasury. Martin O'Malley, former governor, state of Maryland. Teresa Pardo, director, Center for Technology and Government, University at Albany, State University of New York, SUNY and Sonal Shah. She's a former executive director of the Beak Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown University. She's also the national policy director for Pete Buttigieg's presidential campaign. Let's give a round of applause. All of our 2019 Academy Fellows. Good picture.
we want to invite all the fellows up for a group picture while everyone else can actually start going to the reception, which is out these doors and to the right. Thanks. But before you leave. Oh, oh, sorry. But before you leave, don't forget that tomorrow's activities begin at 8.30 with breakfast with group breakout sessions from 9 to 10. We have a full morning, so don't stay up too late, but we do want you to head up to the Chesapeake room for a reception to meet the new fellows. Thank you. See her, or she can't see you. So. I'm tall. Do it again? Good to be in the same car. Oh,